Good afternoon. Oh, hold on. The hill. Hi. Trying to see is my wife working? Can folks hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Great. Hi, I'm Andrew Weiss. I'm Vice President of Studies here at Carnegie. It's a real pleasure to kick off the first of two panels this afternoon dedicated to the fifth anniversary of the war in Donbass and to sort of take a look ahead at the new political realities in Ukraine that have been created by the dramatic uh, election of Vladimir Zelensky. Um, our first session is with Ambassador Kurt Volker, who is the Special Representative for Ukraine Negotiations at the State Department. I think it is no exaggeration to say that in this very polarized and problematic political environment, Ambassador Volker has done an exemplary job of both presenting a clear policy vision of US policy towards Ukraine, of unifying uh, the Western world in the support of Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression, and to be a very practical and effective negotiator for a possible path forward um, against what are obviously very challenging circumstances and uh, no shortage of complications. But it really is a tribute to you, your professionalism, and your experience that you've been able to do all of these things and basically walk between a bunch of raindrops simultaneously. Ambassador Volker um, probably doesn't need much introduction to this uh, crowd, but served as US ambassador to NATO at the end of the, the aughts. Um, he is currently executive director of the McCain Institute, so he is doing this out of uh, his uh, good of his heart, uh, in addition to continuing his role leading the McCain Institute. Um, served at various capacities at the State Department, um, including <coughs> as principal deputy assistant secretary in the European Bureau, and as acting senior director at the NSC under President George W. Bush. It's a real privilege to welcome here Ambassador Volker. Maybe if you could start us off a little bit by describing your recent Mm -hmm. trip to Ukraine. The, you were at the inauguration and you met with President Zelensky and if you could maybe sort of give us a little sense of what you saw sure. in Kiev and what the, the road ahead looks okay, like. Okay, great. Welcome uh, to Carnegie. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. So, so many friends in the audience. I, I feel like I hardly need to say anything because we've been saying it all to each other over so much time anyway, um, but we'll try to summarize it all again. And uh, let me start not with the inauguration last week, which I did go to, but uh, the end of February. Uh, the end of February, February 28th, we had a uh, U.S. guided missile destroyer visit to the port of Odessa. And <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have seen a U.S. guided missile destroyer. It was my first time. Uh, they're really big boats, and they have a lot of stuff on them. Uh, so it was very impressive to see this in the port of Odessa. The Ukrainians were thrilled. This was um, one of the steps that we had taken in response to Russia's uh, um, closure of the Kerch Strait, the attack on the Ukrainian Navy, the imprisonment of the Ukrainian sailors, is we wanted to step up more of a naval presence in the Black Sea, uh, demonstrate our interest in uh, freedom of navigation, be part of a more persistent NATO naval presence through many countries that would be there. So I went for the destroyer visit, um, along with uh, our ambassador to the EU, Gordon Sumland, and some very senior EU officials who were giving a message not only about uh, military presence in the Black Sea area, but also economic support and development support. And then we went to Kyiv, and that evening I had a meeting with uh, Volodymyr Zelensky at his campaign headquarters. And I was very struck then, the uh, first time I had met him, and I had only read press reports up until that point and a, and a few messages from the embassy. Uh, he was very substantive. Uh, his public role as a candidate he's, was that he didn't want to get pinned down on substance and be very vague about what his policies would be if elected. But in private, he was actually quite substantive, very knowledgeable, very detailed. And he also gave a very clear uh, commitment to wanting to reform Ukraine. Saying, every, you know, nothing has really changed. It is still a corrupt system. It's still uh, uh, in need of massive reform. And this is what the people want. And he's prepared to deliver that. Uh, so it was a very forward-leaning uh, presentation by him. And he had with him a couple of people who were relatively well-known reformers uh, in Ukraine who were sitting as part of the meeting. And I think he did that on purpose to demonstrate that they are with him and that he is serious about what he's saying. So that was the first meeting. Then, of course, we finish up the presidential election campaign, and he ends up with 73% of the vote in the second round. So. 
overwhelming mandate from the public. Uh, a second point to make is that these elections were very free and fair. They were very well run. There was not violence, and there was a peaceful transfer of power. So before we go deeper into talking about the new team, let's also say that President Poroshenko has done Ukraine uh, several good turns. Uh, he did more on reform during his tenure as president than had happened in the previous 20 years in Ukraine. And while running to win re-election and losing, he then stepped down gracefully and has facilitated a transfer of power. Now he's going to run and try to keep a seat in the parliament and be part of the oil opposition. I uh, would not you know, expect them to be best of friends, but I think he's done his part in a democratic system, which I think is very positive as well. Now then uh, you have uh, President Zelensky and his inauguration. And uh, I just wanna stress as well that the US engagement in here uh, has been important. Uh, Secretary of State Pompeo called both uh, candidates in the second round on the Friday before the election, that's President Poroshenko and uh, candidate Zelensky. Then when Zelensky won the election, President Trump called him on the night of the election to congratulate him. And then Zelensky advanced the date of, well advanced, he, he called an early date for inauguration. And that was the 20th of May. And we managed to put together a US presidential delegation to go there for the inauguration on really about three days notice. And that was led by Secretary of Energy Rick Perry. Uh, I was there as part of that delegation. Our, again, our ambassador to the EU, Gordon Sondland. We were joined by Senator Ron Johnson and uh, Alex Vindman from the National Security Council and our charge uh, in Kiev, Joe Pennington. Uh, we were there for the inauguration. We saw the speech, which I hope all of you have, have had some exposure to. It was quite a speech, quite interesting, entertaining and dramatic and substantial. And uh, that led, for instance, to the dismissal of parliament that day, a demand that certain legislation be passed, uh, the prime minister resigning, all in a, about a 12 hour period. And uh, we had a bilateral meeting with President Zelensky after the inauguration that lasted about an hour. And again, he was on. He was really uh, demonstrating a commitment to wanting to reform everything. Uh, recognizing that that is what people now expect of him. And uh, with him were some, very, again, very well-known reformers. Uh, there is the current Ukrainian ambassador to NATO, uh, Vadim Pristaiko, who is serving as his de facto diplomatic advisor. And there is uh, Alexander Daniliuk, who just yesterday was formally appointed to be the chair of the National Security and Defense Council. Also with him were uh, Lena Zerkal, who is the deputy foreign minister, also very well respected and, and known, committed to Western uh, orientation of Ukraine. Uh, looks like she will just be staying at her job rather than taking on a new one, uh, but nonetheless, uh, clearly a close part of the team, which is very, all of this is very encouraging. Uh, you will have also seen the news that uh, he appointed after our visit uh, Andre Bogdan as his chief of presidential administration. Bogdan is famous as being the lawyer representing uh, Igor um, uh, Kolomoisky, thank you, uh, Kolomoisky, uh, including in Kolomoisky's lawsuit against the state of Ukraine in seeking damages for U Ukraine's nationalization of Privat Bank. So this is, this is a this is big news, whatever you make of it, that he is appointed to be chief of the presidential administration. Uh, we were hearing rumors of this while we were in Kiev, and um, we talked about it as a US presidential delegation and thought that it's not our place to talk about people, but rather to talk about principles and policies. And the principles are a serious commitment to reform and to thoroughgoing efforts to fight corruption and some bold ideas on how to go about doing that. And that our best advice that we could give to the president is to uh, be credible, uh, to uh, recognize that not only did he win a major victory, but that people now have expectations of him and he can either enhance those credentials or he can cause people to question those credentials uh, through appointments that he makes and through actions that he takes. 
So he's going to have to think about that very carefully. We can't do his thinking for him. And he does face a complex political system, but we did put down a marker on that. Now, that complex political system is that he has no votes in the parliament at the moment for himself or for his agenda. And that is why he needed to call early elections immediately and try to capitalize on his personal popularity and turn that into a political movement, political candidates, and then votes in the parliament. Without doing that, he won't be able to get anything done. And so that's his top priority. Uh, he also needs to have people that are experienced in navigating a notoriously corrupt and backroom political system uh, with a handful of oligarchs that have disproportionate power in the country. And uh, having someone who understands that system can be an asset as long as that person sees himself as working for the president and representing the interests of the Ukrainian people at this stage. And you know, frankly, we, you know, the proof will be in the pudding. We have, we have to see how it, how it goes. But um, it's better to have someone with, who knows what he's doing on your side than a novice. Um, but at the same time, uh, you want to make sure that they're really on your side. Um, that, that's kind of an overview of the steps in the recent days. I'll just add a couple other things. We were invited, the presidential delegation, we were invited by President Trump to meet with him uh, last week after being in Ukraine to give him an update. And I uh, had a further meeting uh, with uh, others with Secretary Pompeo yesterday. And I do feel that there is a very clear and strong US understanding that this is a moment that matters. We need to be reaching out and engaging as much as possible. The future of Ukraine is going over the next several years is going to be determined in this few month period ahead of us through these elections and the government that forms. And everyone else will be competing for relationships and position and how does Ukraine develop from here. It's very important that the US and the West be fully engaged at this time. All right, well, that's a very succinct and I think very helpful way to set a baseline for a few more questions from me. Um, the scale of Zelensky's victory was stunning. And I, I mm -hmm. hard pressed to come up with a comparable landslide um, that isn't rigged. Mm -hmm. um, and since you mentioned and emphasized this was a free and fair election, I think that's a very important point that is impressive yeah. anywhere in the world, not just in a post-communist country. Um, it's clear that 73% mandate, though, is based on a popular anger and frustration with the status quo. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that Zelensky has a big enough sledgehammer and the political will to dismantle the status quo, which has been for decades Ukraine's biggest liability, arguably more than its relationship with its much bigger neighbor? Um, well, not yet is the answer. Uh, he has built a lot of political capital by attracting 73% of the voters behind him. And so that does give him a moral authority and a political capacity to push. But that's not the only thing that matters. Um, political organization matters, money matters, old relationships and, and corrupt relationships matter. And uh, there are plenty of forces outside of government that will be either seeking to oppose him or seeking to strike a deal with him, uh, corrupt him in, in, in a way, say, well, only if. And uh, he, I think, by going to early elections, is trying to continue to build that political capital, that, that ability to get things done. Because, uh, as I said, without getting votes in the parliament that are his or supporting his agenda, it's going to be very difficult to do. Um, I'd like to, at this point, just jump in with one specific issue that uh, I've talked about several times and I think it's important. And that is the need to change the system in Ukraine. The, just we, We've always talked about anti-corruption. We've talked about anti-corruption court. We've uh, talked about a special prosecutor and all those things. And those are all good. I'm not saying that we should not be pushing these things. But I think we also need to think a bit bigger and say that, the prob that corruption in many ways is not the problem. Corruption is the symptom. And the problem is that you have five or six people who own a disproportionate share of the economy and through that have disproportionate control over political parties, over the RADA, over the courts, over the media, and it creates a, uh, a fundamentally corrupt system overall. 
one that has you know, control over governance in Ukraine, control over the judiciary, and squeezes out and discourages any potential foreign investment and the westernization of Ukraine. Uh, so that has got to be changed. And I think a uh, way to go about that would be through uh, EU compliant, uh, e EU coordinated antitrust legislation that would require these people to divest of assets. And if they did so, and did so willingly, um, they would be able to keep their money that they get in return, uh, pay a one-time tax, and get an amnesty for prosecution related to those uh, assets in the past. And um, if they did not, the government could sell those assets off anyway, take a bigger tax, and not give them any immunity from prosecution. And it would be a way to try to repair uh, the damage that the, this system has uh, reaped upon Ukraine up to this point. Again, not easy, will require a lot of effort from the uh, president and others in Ukraine, as well as support from the US and the EU and the IMF, the World Bank. But I think something dramatic like that would need to happen as a way to really change the system. How much do you think Ukraine fatigue is going to be a factor going forward. After 2014, obviously the eyes of the world were all on Ukraine, huge expectations for the incoming government under Poroshenko, sense of drama based mm -hmm. on the war, which we'll come to in a second, but a real unified international response that the United States and Germany basically led. That is not in evidence nearly as much today as it was five years ago. Some of that is mm -hmm. just the world has moved on, the situation seems less dire and there was less, uh, there's less urgency just because Ukraine has consolidated its statehood, something that you should not, no one should have taken for yeah. granted in 2014 or 2015. So exactly. there's huge accomplishments, huge reforms that Poroshenko pushed through with certain yeah. caveats about what else didn't get done. Right. But now the sense of policy urgency is there, policy uh, you know, clearly is more amorphous, like what's the agenda? Mm -hmm. like if you were to pulse your top four or five European counterparts, they may not all totally agree with you on what the immediate priorities should be? Or, or am I mistaken in that? Mm. Well, um, so first off, I think on the fatigue point, uh, I'd say there had been some Ukraine fatigue because things seem to be stuck. So from, a, I'd say, maybe about, I'm trying to do the math here, but 2016 onward, um, nothing seemed to be changing. Uh, either internally or in the relationship with Russia. There was process, there was churn, but everything seems stuck. I don't think that's the case right now. I think with this election, with a, a new president, with a change of power, um, and the genuine popular wave that was behind it, I think that fatigue is suspended. Now, people say, oh, this is interesting. What's going to happen now? And there is a lot of, of new stuff going on. I'd say there's more new where were we today, the 29th? Of, in the last nine days, there's been more new stuff going on with Ukraine than in the past two years. Uh, so I think that is significant. When it comes to fatigue in a different sense, though, I, I do worry about one thing, which is that people are getting used to Russia's occupation and continued fighting. And, and this is a problem, that the people shouldn't forget that uh, every day Ukrainians in the Donbass are... Uh, really um, suffering under difficult humanitarian circumstances. There's been a massive displacement of the population from there, and Russia continues to lead the military forces, to pay for the contract forces, provide the intelligence, support the civil administrations, and they are literally killing Ukrainians every week. And that's something we shouldn't get tired of. On the what needs to happen, I'd say, yeah, you're probably right. You know, you talk talk to five different people and you'll get five different top priorities, but you'll probably get you know, the same five priorities overall, just maybe a little bit of difference of emphasis between the European Union or Canada or ourselves or, the, or those in Ukraine. People have some differences of emphasis, but I think people pretty much see the same picture. Can you talk a little about this interregnum? Um, I noticed in your comments yesterday when you did your press availability that a lot is sort of in suspended animation pending yeah. the RADA elections at the end of July. Um, <coughs> there are reports in the news overnight of a very rocky transition of power 
and the new head of the yeah. Ukrainian equivalent of the National Security Council walked around his offices mm -hmm. with his cell, cell phone, phone and put saying, it on all Facebook. All the computers saying, are gone. Yeah, yes. saying they've taken the servers and the monitors, and this is not the way it's supposed to go. Yeah. Um, what is happening inside the governing apparatus? Is this a kind of you know, people want to take their ball and sort of walk off the field and leave Zelensky to fail? Or is it, you know, is there something, are people going to rise above the petty rivalry that the campaign yeah. brought to them? Well, I think, it's, I think it's option three, <laughs> which is everybody is worried about being prosecuted. Um, so in a situation where everyone is guilty of something, the choice of whom to prosecute is a political decision. And so everyone is now worried about getting prosecuted, so they're just trying to get rid of whatever information might be around that might facilitate that. Uh, and it, on the one hand, it might be true and fair, and on the other hand, it might be politically targeted, and either way, people are gonna be concerned about it. And if I could you know, offer a piece of advice, if you look at what happened in Georgia in 2012, uh, it was a huge mistake for the Georgian dream to spend two years or three years going after the national movement, because it wasted a lot of time in Georgia. And now if you look at where Georgia is and what the Georgian dream as a government has done, they're doing very, very well, but it took them years to get to this point. And I think Ukraine doesn't have the time to waste. So let's talk about the conflict. Um, Zelensky uh, as a candidate, notoriously vague, mm -hmm. unspecific about his policy agenda, but created an expectation that he's the man to end the war, as he said. You know, we didn't start this, but we're the ones who can end it. And then put the focus on, you know, we won't give up territory, but somehow this will be resolved. Right. Are the expectations there being set too high? Well, remember that this is someone running for president. And so what do people in Ukraine want? They want the war to be over. Um, so you're gonna say, I'm gonna end the war. Uh, unfortunately, it's not within his power to do. Uh, it's in Russia's power to do that, uh, and Russia has done the opposite since he's gotten elected. They've actually turned up the pressure on Ukraine rather than turned it down. Uh, but it's, of course, natural for him to say that that's what he wants to do. It's also helpful for him, uh, I think, in terms of the dynamic of dealing with Russia and how that is perceived internationally. It's very important for Ukraine to position itself as saying, we're ready. You know, we would like to negotiate, we would like to see an end to this, we're going to do our share, we support the Minsk agreements, we want to implement the Minsk agreements if, if we can ever get access to the territory. That's the right position for Ukraine to adopt as well. And it does put Rush, it does turn the spotlight back onto Russia, which remarkably, and I don't know if you saw the press conference, there was a press conference between uh, Pompeo and Lavrov in Sochi after Pompeo's meetings there, and when the issue of Ukraine came up, Lavrov addressed it and said, well, we hope with the election of President Zelensky that Ukraine will now get serious about dealing with this internal problem, uh, which is a complete um, denial of any responsibility to the point that it's insulting. Um, and um, that's Russia's position, is that they deny any involvement in eastern Ukraine. They say it's all these other, it's an internal Ukrainian matter, and Ukraine needs to negotiate with the two people's republics that Russia created and sustains. Uh, that's just not a serious position. Can you talk a little bit about the dynamic going forward with the possibility of a presidential meeting between Presidents mm -hmm. Trump and Putin at the end of next month in Osaka. If I'm not mistaken, there was a linkage that was established that meetings like that should not be held pending release of the sailors who were seized at the end of November. The administration's been a bit fuzzy about whether that was the linkage and whether the linkage is changing. Is there a focus at the presidential level that would be helpful to unsticking what looks effectively like, as you say, a situation where the Russians continue to put more and more pressure. Um, they've made this you know, very inflammatory announcement about handing out passports and Donbass. What, what, what should we be expecting to, from a right. presidential level encounter next month, if it happens? Yeah, if it happens, which we're still not 100% yeah. clear on. Um, 
So to, to go back to December, remember there was a plan to have a Trump-Putin meeting in Argentina, and it was canceled because within the, the week prior to that, Russia had attacked the Ukrainian Navy and uh, taken the ships and imprisoned the sailors, took them back to Russia. And so uh, the meeting was called off. And I think that was a very good step. I think it was the right thing to do. And we have continued since then to insist that the sailors be released, uh, including as recently as yesterday. <laughs> uh, so we, we continue to push this. Russia has, again, they lost a court case on this recently. They are in complete contravention of international law. Uh, there is no basis on which to continue the detention of these sailors, and yet they do it anyway. And they've announced that they've extended the pretrial detention of the sailors to put it on the other side of the parliamentary elections in Ukraine now, uh, which is uh, just a despicable uh, way to act. Uh, now that, that's, that is where we are. In addition to that, uh, and you saw Secretary Pompeo visit President Putin and meet with Lavrov in Sochi, uh, we have, in addition to Ukraine, several other issues in very bad shape with Russia too. Uh, we have arms control and nuclear issues. We have Venezuela. We have Syria. We have North Korea. Uh, we have our general diplomatic standoff with them, including over intelligence. We, we have military deployments. We have, um, um, obviously, uh, not only the Donbass, but also Russia's uh, claimed annexation of Crimea. So there is a long list of issues with Russia that are not good. And as a general proposition, I think this would probably be a proposition of Bill and, and you here at Carnegie would agree with, you would like our leaders to be able to meet and talk and see if we can cool it off a little bit, find something that we can do constructively. And that is not saying that we don't care about Ukraine or other issues. It's just saying we, we ought to try to be able to manage this major disagreement among you know, two big countries. Um, Still not clear we're going to be able to do it, <laughs> but that's that's where we are. Now, whether that means that they would meet without the sailors being released, uh, it would be yes if that meeting happens in Japan because Russia has clearly said they're not going to release the sailors. And that's a, that's a tough one, but it may be that uh, for the greater good of trying to create some kind of stability in, a, in an otherwise very fractious U.S.-Russia relationship, you need to have at least some meetings. So let me ask you two more questions, and then I'll open things up uh, to the folks here, many of whom, as you noted, are known uh, friends and admirers of yours. Um, there is a perception I've heard, and it may be overstated, but I think it's, it's worth addressing, that the West did not want Mr. Zelensky to win, and that this was a you know, sort of unwelcome upstart who you know, didn't stand for anything and who didn't have the same sort of identity as the defender of Ukraine that his predecessor had. Um, is that a challenge going forward for the West? Do, is there a set of you know, sort of you know, bad blood or, or misgivings right. in the Zelensky camp about how we viewed his arrival, yeah. which obviously yeah. came out of nowhere on some Well, level. when you say the West, I assume you're talking about Europe. Uh, because I think there, there was an effort, you know, Merkel met with um, Poroshenko during the election campaign. Uh, he had a visit to Brussels during the election campaign. And so I think there is a little bit of frustration in the Zelensky team that Europe did try to show you know, engagement with Poroshenko. Um, not deep frustration because you know, we were joking a little bit, but you know, there's only one Europe and you're gonna have to deal with Europe. Um, US did not do that. Uh, I was very pleased with uh, this. In fact, President Poroshenko was complaining to us that we weren't doing enough to support him. And our response was consistently, we don't pick people. We stand for the principles and the policies. And whoever's going to lead Ukraine, we will work with them. And we want to see a Ukraine that is reforming, it's strengthening democracy, it's fighting corruption, that, um, and we support Ukraine's Western orientation. And uh, we, you know, whoever the voters choose, uh, we will support whoever wins based on our support for those principles. And I think that that has positioned us so well post-election as well. And I, I think it's always the right stance to take, we should not be trying to pick people in elections. Could not agree more. And I, I think the other point is that 
the imperative to support Ukraine and to push a reform agenda, regardless of how you feel about our Russia policy, that that is mm -hmm. a prerequisite. And I think there is broad unity between the United States and our European there partners is. about that. There is. Um, one issue that has cropped up, which I think is unfortunate in the last couple of weeks, is a sense that the very polarized and overheated U.S. political climate is starting to bleed into Ukraine policy, potentially. Mm -hmm. At least there is a, you know, an effort to bring you know, the 2020 presidential campaign into Ukraine, the U.S. presidential campaign, with people like the president's lawyer, Mr. Giuliani, seeking evidence and other things that he claims will be potentially uh, important to bring to light about Ukraine's involvement in the 2016 situation in the United States and Russian interference, uh, as well as questions about former Vice President Biden. How, how does it feel to you? Is it mm -hmm. possible to kind of draw a ring fence around our support for Ukraine and this important moment of transition and try to keep the politics yeah. out? Or is that well, getting hard? No, it's, it's actually not. Um, so uh, I, I wouldn't use the, the phrase bleeding into the relationship because that's really not right. I mean, the, the, the actual relationship with Ukraine and with the new presidential team, what we see, that's one thing. What is happening is it's getting into the media and into the atmospherics around Ukraine in our domestic politics. And so uh, the way I would say it is that I think President Trump uh, in the wake of the Mueller investigation having been concluded, uh, and there not being a, any uh, accusation of collusion, is now going on the offensive and saying, well, the only collusion was people trying to feed Hillary Clinton's campaign information to damage me, President Trump. And so that's, he's now pushing that. That is all a domestic political narrative. Uh, and what I would say is, is that um, Zelensky, having just been elected, had nothing to do with anything happening in 2016 in Ukraine. He's got no stake in this. It doesn't really matter there. Other people in Ukraine are trying to use the US domestic politics as a vehicle for their own engagement, either in fighting their domestic enemies inside Ukraine or trying to feel like they've got some special relationship with people in the United States. Uh, you know, they may try to do that, but I don't think that affects U.S. policy, and I don't think it affects what Zelensky is going to be trying to do in Ukraine. Okay. All right. Well, we've got time for a couple of questions. If folks could uh, do me a couple of favors. One, wait for the microphone. Two, introduce yourself. Three, keep it brief, and it needs to end with a question mark. So let me <laughs> start over there, please, in the middle. Hi, thank you so much um, for your interesting comments on Ukraine. Um, I'm, I'm Amy, by the way, I'm from Foreign Policy Magazine. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment on whether um, President Trump has any plans to have a phone call with Zelensky or any meetings or kind of sideline meetings over the next three months. Yeah. Thanks. Um, this was a topic that we discussed with President Trump when we came back. Um, we do not have a, a decision yet on exactly how this is going to work, but it is very much on uh, mind of the administration that we need to be continuing engagement, including at the president's level. How we do that, I, I can't answer today, but it is up there. All the way in the back. Um, good afternoon. My name is Askold Krushelnitsky. Um, I'm from uh, the Ukrainian newspaper Cave Post. Um, uh, Dr. Volker mentioned that um, the former Ukrainian president, Poroshenko, had um, been um, complaining or upset that there wasn't enough um, support for him from the US. Can you say what sort of support um, he um, hoped to receive from the US in his election bid? No, I think it's just an attitudinal thing. He just. He, obviously, he's running for re-election. He wanted to be re-elected. He wanted people to come out and support his re-election. And um, uh, we did not do that as a matter of national policy, US policy. Uh, as I said, we are not going to be endorsing any candidate. Uh, so we are endorsing principles. And I certainly do give him credit, uh, a lot of credit, for the reforms that were enacted while he was president and the way that he um, has conducted himself in the 
uh, transition of power. Uh, overall, this has been a very peaceful and a very successful democratic transition, which I think is what um, you know what needs to become the norm in countries in the in what had been uh, the Soviet Union and what is now uh, a, a very dynamic part of Central and Eastern Europe. We have one last question from Sandy Birchbaum. Andy Bershbow, Atlantic Council. Hi. Thanks, Sandy? Kurt, for doing this. Uh, question about dialogue with the Russians, yours. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it sort of dried up uh, over the last year, I know. Have you had any uh, indications of a, any renewed interest on the Russians' part? Certainly the public statements would not suggest that. Chesnikov, right. Lavrov, they're all saying it's up to the Ukrainians. Right. It's all their fault, et cetera. So uh, as you know, because we've talked about this, but we had uh, some exchanges at the beginning of the year uh, with Surkov just to see, are they ready to talk? Uh, yeah, it's exchanged some notes with him. I had a, a follow-up discussion with the Russian ambassador here. And the Russians were very clear that they were not prepared to engage before the presidential election was over. And so now that that is behind us and we have a new president, uh, I intend to uh, reconnect. I haven't heard anything from the Russian side. Uh, but that's okay. I'll take the initiative and say, well, I'm prepared to connect um, to see whether they think it would be productive to meet now. Uh, we haven't had any communication from the Russian side. We have, however, seen actions by the Russian side. And uh, that is, for instance, the passports, the lack of a congratulatory phone call to Zelensky, uh, a uh, lack of a Easter ceasefire that just they just kind of piled on this year rather than taking a break. So we're not optimistic that they are ready to engage now. It may be after the parliamentary elections take place. It may, be, may not be. Um, I am concerned that I think Russia feels that it uh, is, is happy with the situation as it is, that uh, they can sustain this for a very long time, and it gives them some pressure and some leverage over Kiev, and they're prepared to continue with it. And our perspective on this is that whether or not we make progress in bringing peace in the Donbass, which is what we want, we nonetheless have to make sure that Ukraine is succeeding and sustainable as a uh, reforming democracy and market economy and a part of the Euro-Atlantic community. And that part uh, has gone well. Um, if you consider where we were a couple of years ago, there were questions over whether the Trump administration would continue with sanctions, whether we would continue the Obama administration's arms embargo on Ukraine, whether we would recognize uh, Russia's claimed annexation of Crimea. And uh, the opposite has been the case. We, we have increased sanctions. We have lifted the arms embargo. We, the Pompeo Declaration is, is clear about um, US non-recognition of Russia's claimed annexation of Crimea, and we've done this in very, very close coordination with our European allies so that the Russians are not getting any daylight in this position here. And Ukraine has, I think, benefited from this. And if you look at it from the perspective of Russia's principal goal, which appears to be to reassert dominance over Ukraine, that Ukraine would be a part of the Russian sphere of influence, it has produced the opposite, that Ukraine is, has a stronger sense of national identity, more Russia skeptic, more pro-Western, more pro-NATO, more pro-EU uh, than ever before. And that is especially true in the younger generation. And I, I think if you are facing conscription or your friends are facing conscription and some of them are getting killed or wounded on the front line, I think that's probably very clarifying for people. Okay, well, Ambassador Volker, I think we'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you, you very much for being Thank with us today. Thank you very today. much. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. That was great. Appreciate it. Okay. So, folks, please stick around. We have another group that's going to join us up now. We'll, we'll move to the second part of our conversation. Yeah. Don't forget your glasses. Great. Thank, Thank you very thanks, much. Kurt. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. 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 Arlen, how are you? Bravo. We've got two seconds. You. Sure. Let me take off the mic. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
Okay. No, I'll sit in the middle. It's fine. Okay. No, it's fine. That's fine. Okay. Okay. So why don't we get started? I appreciate folks. Um, okay. So we are very fortunate to have a second group of experts to follow on uh, Ambassador Volker's comments. Um, we're going to dig into some of the issues that Ambassador Volker touched on in his remarks um, in some greater detail. From I'm going to start with uh, it, from left to right. Uh, at the very far left is Ambassador Petrus uh, Vaitikunas, who has played a really important role in the history of Lithuania, was one of the original signatories of the Lithuanian Declaration of Independence in 1991. Um, uh, then served as foreign minister of Lithuania from 2006 to 2008, and then as U Lithuania's ambassador to Ukraine until 2014. After 2014, he became uh, an embedded advisor to the secretary of Ukraine's version of the NSC, the National Security and Defense, which he held until last week. Um, uh, to my left is this, uh, Professor uh, Oksana Cheval of Tufts University, who's an associate professor at Tufts, where she focuses on post-communist countries, transitions, and the like, um, is originally from Ukraine and holds a PhD from Harvard. Uh, to my right is Marek Minkishik, who is the head of the Russia Department at the Institute of Eastern Studies in Warsaw, Poland. And at the far end, last but not least, is Charlie Kupchin. Charlie is a professor at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations until January 2017. He was the senior director and special assistant to President Obama on the NSC staff in charge of European affairs, which includes a very intensive period working on uh, resolution of the conflict in Ukraine. We're going to start this conversation with a couple of sort of broad questions to the four of them, and then very much expect this to be a sort of two-way exchange, and I'll open things up uh, very quickly, and hopefully people can start uh, coming in with your own thoughts and reactions. Let me start with you, Ambassador. You've just come from Kiev. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the atmosphere is like in Kiev, what the transition has been like, and what your expectations are going forward for President Zelensky? Does he have a vision for governing? Does he have a team? that he can put in place that can translate that vision into reality? Yes. A <clears throat> uh, couple of us, how we see uh, the situation in Ukraine after the new presidential elections. Uh, first of all, I would like to stress that uh, everybody in Ukraine understands, and uh, many in, in Europe, that uh, our, our strategy toward, towards Russia, Russia first, I name the strategy as so Russia first, uh, failed, failed miserab miserably, and uh, we all, uh, America and Europe and, uh, and uh, Eastern Europe needs a new strategy, new paradigm, solid and reliable paradigm for future relations with Russia. And this uh, uh, new paradigm, to my understanding, na name is not uh, Russia first, but Ukraine first. We have to create conditions under which uh, Ukraine could achieve the success and to demonstrate success for Russian people. That would, would be very, very important and, and, uh, and reliable step forward. Uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, Ukrainians are waiting from the United States and Europe? Uh, first of all, a very clear message that election is over, that enemy is at the gate, enemy is in the east, and uh, two major players, Zelensky and uh, Poroshenko, must uh, stop fighting with each other and concentrate uh, efforts on common tasks. Common tasks, uh, uh, defending country. And my personal advice to Mr. Zelensky would be, Zelensky would be not trust to President Putin, because the Kremlin wants to entrap him in, 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 in such situation, and to concentrate 
concentrate on reforms, concentrate on fulfilling uh, foreign um, policy uh, main goals and issues, uh, EU and NATO. Uh, to my understanding, giving uh, Ukraine a EU perspective and uh, perspective of uh, NATO membership, um, namely membership action plan, would be very useful and uh, decrease the conflict with Russia uh, possibility. How, how uh, the situation, I would like to say some, some, some that's how volunteers, volunteers and uh, uh, veterans, veterans of, of war see the red lines uh, for President Zelensky. Uh, first of all, it's separate negotiations with the Russian Federation and separate negotiations with uh, so-called administration of, uh, of uh, Lugansk and Donetsk regions, so-called Medvedchuk plan, plan uh, peace plan. Uh, in brief, such plan would be to allow President Putin to leave Donbass without, without paying uh, for aggression and uh, to, to forget about Crimea's uh, occupation and annexation. It uh, would be completely unacceptable, not only, I can guarantee, not only for uh, for uh, uh, volunteers and veterans and uh, 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 radicals of, of Ukraine, but also for, uh, I guess, for us, for Lithuania, definitely. Uh, 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 next uh, red line, as they stressed to me, is autonomy of Donbass and federalization of, uh, of Ukraine under the Russians, uh, condi uh, Kremlin's conditions. Amnesty. Amnesty itself uh, is not a red line, a pure uh, red line for, for Zelensky. It, amnesty is possible, but only after capitulation. Capitulation of all hitmans and gunmen and, and terrorists in Donbass. Uh, exchange Crimea to Donbass, so-called uh, trade to ter territory, also is one of, of uh, red lines for President Zelensky. Revenge and return to power Yanukovych peoples. Um, and uh, also this very strange uh, idea uh, as concerns referendum on negotiation format with Russian Federation, unacceptable, completely unacceptable for a for, for, uh, very important part of, uh, of Ukrainians. Returning private bank uh, to oligarch and or compensations for this. Uh, uh, maybe that would be. Okay. So My, what I would like to stress in general is that uh, in general, a settlement of any conflict. Any conflict is, is not an end point, end goal, goal, goal for President Putin. His uh, instrument is to create uh, around Russia unsuccessful countries, to create a conflict, to create uh, uncertainties. And um, uh, this uh, approach of Western people approach using win-win strategy will not work with, uh, with President Putin. You simply have to press President Putin by sanctions, uh, responding to each uh, provocation in an asymmetric way, uh, responding with sanctions, and uh, to my understanding, the depotinization, depotinization of Russia is inevitable, I don't know in what uh, terms, but we should be ready for this. So, Oksana, could you talk a little bit about the expectations gap in Ukrainian society where we have such huge public support for President Zelensky and the views that he embodied as a candidate? Um, and then, as Ambassador Volker was saying, there's another 
reality, which is a system of state capture and cynicism um, that presumably will continue to be pushing against any meaningful change. Can right. you talk a little bit about how if Ukrainian society wants peace, and how you know the, is, we've talked a little bit privately, the public polls, public opinion polls seem to suggest peace is a top priority for for the Ukrainian electorate. What what do you think is realistic to expect from Zelensky on right. the conflict? Okay. Yeah, so sort of like two questions here, like one kind of specific to the conflict and one about this kind of gap of expectations. Um, you know, bro broadly, maybe I'll start with this, with this sort of broader issue and then come back to conflict. So it is true, right, that, that you know, that Zelensky won with this mandate, as Ambassador Walker was saying, kind of cleaning house and, you know, combating corruption. And I think it's very telling that he was able to attract kind of the vote that he did across this um, historical East-West, uh, quote-unquote, divide, right? But it's also important to keep in mind that people filled his candidacy with very different expectations. In other words, you know, there were people, uh, essentially, who used to vote for Poroshenko, right? Kind of, broadly speaking, sort of the Western half of Ukraine, right? Um, where people uh, basically hoped or believed that he would more or less continue the same policies, kind of on foreign policy in particular, but would not be as corrupt as Poroshenko, right? And that's kind of, um, you know, the, the hope of, of that part of the electorate, right? Now, another part of the electorate, kind of more, you know, in the central and the east of the country, which historically has voted, you know, in the past for, say, Yanukovych parties, right? They, uh, you know, in addition to hearing about corruption, which all Ukrainians do, actually had the expectations that he would turn kind of more towards Russia, right? Perhaps like, you know, in sort of, in, at least in that direction to a greater extent than Poroshenko did and would be, you know, not as maybe categorical on some of these cultural issues, be it, you know, language policy or memory politics and so forth. So clearly, right, like he cannot fulfill possibly the expectations of these, you know, of all of these people, right? So but whenever he starts making concrete decisions, right, this is when uh, he will inevitably begin losing support, right? And the question sort of is, right, if his support uh, diminishes, you know, would he be able to do whatever his agenda is, right? Um, and I think, um, you know, also the question is what is realistic, right? So, so for the realistic part, I'll talk a little bit more about Donbass specifically since this is what, you know, we are, we are here for um, the anniversary of the start of the conflict, right? And is his, one of his key campaign promises was exactly that, that he would be able to solve, um, you know, conflict um, in Donbass. And that has brought public support. Um, people favor compromises. I mean, again, depending how the question is asked, there is a small minority that would favor any compromise on any terms. Kind of like, you know, what uh, Ambassador Volker was saying. I mean, I and I think that's true. I think you could have compromise tomorrow, right? If you agree to Russia's terms, essentially would be, you know, some sort of, you know, Ukraine formally committing to some kind of non-aligned status. And these regions coming back to Ukraine uh, I mean, the, the uh, LNR and DNR, right, with the veto power over decisions of the central government and then Ukraine footing the bill uh, also for reconstruction, right, and sort of Crimea being taken off the agenda and sanctions li lifted, like that kind of thing, right? So that's clearly not um, the type of peace deal uh, that would have broad support, um, you know, among uh, voters in Ukraine. Now, what exactly the voters would support, I think that sort of it becomes a lot less clear because people have been asked about specific, in some polling, uh, um, as recently as December, so just a few months ago, about concrete steps that were in the Minsk agreement, such as, say, amnesty, such as these regions having some sort of autonomous status, as opposed to just decentralization, as opposed to just being si similar to other regions in Ukraine, and there is much less support for these concrete measures. So I think whenever Zelensky finds himself kind of having to stick his guns, so to say, or like make a stake and commit to specific policy measures, he's going to find himself, um, I think, in a potentially, you know, certainly would not have 73% support, let me put it this way. Now, so so the specifics of the settlement, I mean, um, I know Charlie will come back to it so we can, you know, talk a little bit more about it, but I see that the problems that were preventing the settlement and the implementation of the Minsk agreements under Poroshenko remain there under President Zelensky. Uh, Ambassador Volker already mentioned one problem, obviously, is Russia itself. If its position is that it's simply not party to this conflict, that it's purely Ukrainian affair, right, Ukrainian problem, right, and they're just there, I don't know, like they have some tourists there or whatever, right? Like, I mean, that's clearly, right, if they're not willing to compromise in some substantive way, that makes the whole solution more difficult. But there are these kind of three concrete areas um, of the Minsk agreements, and on, on each of which um, there are essentially issues that have not been resolved, that proved to be very difficult to resolve, and I personally don't see, at least as of today, that Zelensky would be able to really make progress on these. This has to do with uh, holding elections in these territories, 
um, with kind of achieving the, the extent of security and sort of ceasefire that would allow for democratic free and fair elections to take place and sort of what constitutes the security, right? And what has to come first, some kind of political measures or uh, and or security measures. And then finally, this kind of uh, end goal, this constitutional settlement and what status would these regions have, like say, if and when they indeed are integrated, right? Kind of this final step. And on all of these issues, there has been problems. I'm. Um, you know, the, for, for the elections in particular, there have been outstanding disputes um, as to, say, which parties would be allowed to run. Would all Ukrainian parties be allowed to run? Or only certain parties, say, maybe excluding nationalist, you know, far-right parties. Uh, who would be able to vote? People, say, who lived there in 2014. Um, people who have maybe moved there since then, right? People who now live elsewhere in Ukraine, like how that would be conducted. Who would most importantly administer and counter the votes, right? Ukrainians have long held a view that it's, you know, that separate authorities themselves uh, cannot be trusted with sort of running free and fair election. If it is some kind of international community, say OEC and so forth, it presupposes certain level of, you know, of peace and stability that has not been achieved. So here we come again to this kind of broader issue of security. Again, Minsk agreement provides for ceasefire, for withdrawal of heavy weapons, for creating the situation when there is enough you know, sort of stability and security, physical security that elections could take place. That has been difficult to achieve. Again, I know Charlie will talk about it. So, uh, so these things are there, right? And uh, again, from what Zelensky said so far, right, that has not been, um, he hasn't really proposed anything concrete, right? Um, he does have this window of opportunity, he does have this popular support. Um, what he can do single-handedly, and this is something that maybe, you know, I would sort of say there is some hope here that at least some progress could be made. He certainly could change some of the administrative um, re regulations that were adopted uh, by Ukraine that regulates things such, say, say such as access of the people from LNR and DNR, Ukrainian citizens who live there to uh, say educational opportunities within Ukraine, so facility to travel, um, right? The uh, say getting their documents because one of the issues I'll, I'll say some words <coughs> about this Russian passportization in a moment, but one of the real serious problems there is that say when there are new births or, or marriages or deaths and so forth at this part of the country, it's very difficult and sometimes impossible for people to get any kind of Ukrainian documents, right? Certifying their say marital status or the birth of the child, right? And that is something that, you know, you, certainly, you know, Ukrainian government, uh, you know, new government could think creatively and sort of more, be more people friendly. And Zelensky said himself in the campaign that he wants to reach out to these people, that he considers them, you know, Ukrainian citizens, that yes, there is Russian propaganda there, but he kind of sort of sees himself reaching to that part of the population to make them sort of feel more part of Ukraine, greater Ukraine, right? So that would be something that he could do. Now, uh, again, going back to the Russian, uh, the obstacles that Russia poses, in, in addition to sort of this long-standing view, which I totally agree with Ambassador Volker, is a big obstacle to the settlement if Russia just sort of takes this position like that's, you know, nothing to do with us, like, you know, this is internal Ukrainian conflict and, you know, don't ask us to kind of, you know, do anything. That's really not constructive. But I think they have sort of escalated or, or aggravated the problem with this new decree on the passportization, essentially extending Russian citizenship to people who live in, this, in the LNR and DNR, right, the Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, occupied territories, because what now basically happens that uh, since uh, some unknown number of people by media accounts, it seems starting with the government, local so-called government officials who are getting the Russian passports, right? Minsk agreement provides, uh, Minsk agreements provide that representatives uh, from these uh, parts of the country would uh, be appointed as judges, as prosecutors in consultation with the local councils that are to be elected under these elections that still hasn't taken place. And they would also compose a local militia, right? So local uh, security services, right? Now, if that was difficult to begin with, because of course a lot of narrative in Ukraine is that there are many sort of terrorists, quote unquote, right? People who committed human rights abuses, who are separatists and so forth. Now they're also going to have Russian passports, right? So to have this kind of group of people to be then given some officially, you know, by the Ukrainian side, positions of authority um, within, you know, again, if, if we kind of imagine ourselves reaching some kind of conflict settlement, I think that makes the settlement all the more, all the more difficult, right? And the fact that Russia did it within two days of, you know, three days after Zelensky got elected, I think goes to show that at least so far they have not extended, you know, the goodwill. And maybe I really trying to pressure, you know, as several colleagues already mentioned, kind of this inexperience of Zelensky, maybe kind of, you know, trying to see how far they can get, how far they can push him. And I think this passportization decree served that kind of point, you know, escalating and, um, you know, cornering Ukraine in some way. So maybe I'll be okay. here. And, okay. Um, so, Mark, could you talk a little bit about, so, so I hear what Oksana is saying, which is this idea that Zelensky is inexperienced. The ambassador said, you know, he's going to be potentially trapped by the Russians. 
Um, can you talk about the risks and the dangers that Zelensky actually may represent? And the, you know, the public perception of him is, you know, he has some oligarch friends, he may, you know, represent a more potentially flexible position than the stalwart candidate that he opposed in the elections. But, but I'm curious if you think there's another side of the coin, and if you could just sort of focus on that piece. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think the, for, for Russians, uh, Zelensky uh, is both uh, some opportunity and a challenge. Um, Russians were somehow prepared, at least for some time, for Zelensky's victory. Probably what was unexpected is the, the level of this uh, victory, so the landslide he, he got. Um, it is bad signal for, for Moscow because it means that, that Zelensky has, has a big mandate. But on the other hand, it's part, paradoxically a good news because it, created, it has created a huge uh, pressure on him in terms of hopes he raised probably exaggerated because he basically is very difficult to de deliver on those hopes, which I agree tend to be conflicting sometimes. So the basic Russian approach uh, before the elections was to delay, to wait and see and to delay anything, any decisions, any serious actions uh, to uh, the, uh, before, uh, before to the elections. Uh, and now they will try, at bad, do their best to weaken Zelensky and trying to trap him. Uh, and what is, what is the, the, the idea here as, 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 we, try, as we understand it? Uh, first, uh, why Zelensky can be an opportunity from seeing from Moscow? Well, Zelensky is perceived in Moscow as, as a very different person than Poroshenko, uh, a person who is, uh, 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 represents a secular Russian-speaking Ukraine uh, with much more pragmatic or rather even positive approach towards R Russian, Russians, uh, uh, not necessarily the Russian, the Russian leadership. Um, also, um, Zelensky uh, prioritized uh, peace uh, with, uh, with uh, Russia, uh, peace over, over Donbas conflict, and by indicating that there is an issue of referendum possibly, it's a clear signal that, well, while there will be a very difficult negotiation process, probably, and if there will be a deal, we will have to, we Ukrainians will have to sacrifice something for, for this deal, to have this peace we so badly need. Um, so it is creates a window of opportunity for the Russians to push their own agenda. So basically to have some elements of their demands uh, to be met by Ukrainian side. And the part of it, for example, is to to some extent, to uh, get into a, a Russian narrative about the conflict. So the Russian narrative, obviously, as, I, as it was said before, is that is a civil war. And the other side, I mean, the, the other conflicting side, uh, is, is our Donbas people and Donbas leadership. And Russia is, is, is not an aggressor. It's uh, not a party to the conflict. It's, it's the peace broker, basically which is obviously a, a, a bizarre distortion of reality. But indication that, uh, which, which post coming from the Iran Zelensky camp, is that the um, probable getting into a direct negotiations with, uh, with Donbass uh, will be used by Russians to support this narrative and actually to, to make, uh, to, make uh, to some extent, uh, the, the Kiev dependent on the, on the separatists, which are, of course, con politically controlled by Moscow. So uh, it, it is the part of the trap. Uh, 
Another pro problem is the potential issue of autonomy, a certain degree of autonomy for Donbas. The Russians would be extremely happy if they, there could be a, 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 this kind of autonomy towards Donbas, which will create a window of opportunity for Russia to actually to use Donbas to influence whole Ukraine. Uh, so Donbas, uh, seen as a formally reintegrating with Ukraine, meaning that the political uh, uh, parties and the, the people of Donbas could vote in overall Ukrainian elections, rising the level of support for pro-Russian forces or Russia pragmatic forces, and also uh, uh, moving the burden, economic burden uh, uh, of, of Donbas uh, uh, support from Russia to Ukraine, but possibly partly to the West, uh, because obviously there is a, there is an issue of of, of uh, uh, money, uh, uh, Russian money coming to Donbas. Basically, Russian would be eager to to save on that. Uh, the, and of course, the issue of sanctions. Uh, some elements of. Uh, solution of, of uh, at least formally uh, a solution of, of, of the Donbass uh, by that way would create a, a strong incentive to relax sanctions uh, towards Russia. First of all by the EU which is the, 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 the most probable. The, the more hardest part is the US sanctions because there are some much less flexibility in that, but still there is there is an incentive here. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, there are some uh, challenges, serious challenges for for Russia with Zelensky, and part of them are the same actually, which uh, are the base of of some hopes. So because Zelensky is representing this uh, secular uh, Russian-speaking Ukraine. It have, he has a, a much more possibility to unify the country and actually to bring people uh, from the southeast of Ukraine to be uh, positively engaged and recognized as, as true patriots of, of Ukraine, which is against the, the, the Russian interest, because Russian interest is to have weak and divided Ukraine where people are frustrated and with the West and the Ukrainians are mutually, uh, 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 there is a mutual, uh, mutual uh, uh, fatigue uh, of, of, of between the West and Ukraine. Uh, and another issue is that his popularity uh, in the Southeast may eventually make him popular in Donbass and even in Russia, especially if he will be successful, at least uh, uh, to some extent, in fighting corruption and reforming the country. So fighting corruption and reforming the country uh, by Zelensky, which seemed to be at least uh, uh, the, a strong commitment on his part, uh, is, a, is, a, is a danger, is a danger for Russia, because it, uh, first of all, it ruins the whole narrative of Russian propaganda about Ukraine uh, as a failed state, as a corrupt country, as a, as a country when where revo so-called revolution bring actually nothing to the people, uh, which is uh, used also by Russian propaganda domestically in Russia. So Russia is very much afraid of a situation of successful Ukraine, of successful reforms. And if Zelensky will be able to deliver on that, that it will create a powerful example also for at least part of the Russian society, which were really, really fascinated. Uh, many Russians watched uh, uh, Ukrainian politics, Ukrainian debates, and watched all the Ukrainian election process with fascination because they, they lack this in their own country. They, they lack proper politics. And in Ukraine, it was real democracy at work. And this is potentially dangerous for the Kremlin. And therefore, they will, tr get, they will try to get in, uh, Zelensky into a trap. So suggesting with a small carrot, well, we may think about releasing sailors 
and uh, in, in, in future, maybe in stages, uh, we can uh, possibly offer you some uh, some uh, cheaper uh, cheaper gas deliveries because you are not buying our gas. Um, uh, uh, but on the other hand, giving the the big sticks, so passportization, uh, sanctions on oil products uh, 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 delivery to Ukraine and uh, all this uh, negative uh, uh, messages and statements by, by Russia. Uh, when Zelensky has prioritized peace, uh, the Russian uh, will try to get him trapped in on that. So the, the, to present him with a dilemma, whether to uh, satisfy partially at least hopes of the people to end conflict, uh, but at the price of serious concessions to, to the Russians, which would uh, embrace some of uh, Moscow's interests, or to fail to deliver, actually, uh, uh, to the people, making, him even more, making them, the people of Ukraine, even more frustrated uh, that, actually, we can't, do, we can't change anything in, in this uh, very dangerous situation. So this is a kind of dilemma Russians would like to put him in. Uh, in my opinion. So, so Charlie, as a former negotiator working on this conflict, do you hear the elements of stalemate and, you know, immovable, unbridgeable divides, or do you see more possibilities coming out of Zelensky's inauguration and the fact that this, you know, conflict has in many ways put uh, both Russia and Ukraine in an unwelcome, you know, undesirable end state? Uh, <clears throat> I see more possibilities and opportunities than downsides, but only because the previous situation was solidified, to put it mildly. Uh, the dialogue, uh, as we heard from Kurt, was non-existent. Uh, the, the, the polarization of the Russian side and the, and the Ukrainian side seemed to be irreversible. There really was no movement. And uh, I would say the, the early data points are not, are not terribly encouraging because the Russians could have come out of the box by offering some kind of, of uh, sign of, of, of a willingness to uh, to at least reopen the conversation. Instead, they do the passport thing. Uh, the, the Ukrainian sailors uh, don't, don't seem to be any closer to getting out than they were months ago. Uh, I didn't know this until I think it was, was Kurt that was speaking, who said that the new head of the presidential administration is Kolomoisky's lawyer. Uh, that is not, to me, an encouraging sign. Uh, that uh, a, uh, an oligarch's lawyer is now basically the chief of staff of the Ukrainian government. So I, I'm, I'm seeing worrying things. Uh, but that having been said, I do, I do believe that there is a window of opportunity here that uh, the international community should, should take advantage of uh, for, for a couple of different reasons. One is that I think both parties would prefer to end the conflict. Uh, and I, I say it that based on my own assessment that on balance, Russia would like to get out of Donbass. Uh, I wouldn't say that about Crimea. I wouldn't say it about Abkhazia. I wouldn't say it about South Ossetia. But I do think that if there is one nut that can be cracked in the long list of places where uh, the West and Russia are at odds, it's, it's Donbass. Uh, and... Um, as a consequence, I think that, uh, that the U.S. Ought to, ought to try to take advantage of, of the new administration in Kiev to, to really kind of jump in and, and try, to, try to push this. Uh, I, I would also recommend that the United States work more closely with its European allies. Uh, during the Obama administration, there was the Normandy format which the Germans and the French led on, and then there was the U.S. effort, which was really 
side by side with the European effort, but not integrated with it. That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and I got the sense just from listening to Kurt that that, that hasn't changed. He is still dealing with Sirkov one-to-one, -one, as Toria Newland and I were, rather than meeting with the, uh, you know, in, in, in our times, it would have been the German national security advisor, Christoph Huysgen, and the French national security advisor, Jacques Odiber. Uh, so th that would be another recommendation. Let's, let's gang up uh, and lean into this in a, in, a, in a collective way. The final point I'd make is that, um, and this is another reason that I, I believe that it is worth leaning into to this issue while the, the situation is still fluid, is that I don't think that the Russians and the Ukrainians are that far apart on the details. Uh, when we were in the weeds on the Minsk process, I would say that we were 90% of the way to a deal if you, if you simply look at the specific provisions. That is to say, how would the elections take place? Who would vote? What's the role of the Central Election Commission? What's the role of the local election commissions? How is special status going to work? How's amnesty going to work? What comes first? I mean, there, there was a real meeting of the minds, and the biggest problem that, that we all tripped over was the sequencing, with the Russians saying, political steps first, then we pull back. The Ukrainians saying, first the Russians pull back, and then we move forward on the, the political provisions in the Minsk agreements. And Poroshenko would say, how, how could I possibly move forward on these political provisions for which I need RADA support if Ukrainians are dying on the contact line, which they were. And that's a very legitimate argument. Uh, and we couldn't get to the point where there was an agreement about how you would get close enough to the start line that the implementation of Minsk would begin. So my, my recommendation as a way to start is to go back and, and take off the shelf the very substantial uh, consensus that had emerged on most parts of Minsk and find a way of trying to jumpstart the conversation with confidence-building measures. Uh, and I think the, the way to start would be to go back where we were in the second half of 2016, which is finding a way to create specific delimited, demilitarized zones along the line of contact, let's say 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers on each side, from which the separatist forces would pull back, the Ukrainian forces would pull back, heavy weapons would be put into depots. If it works on this 10 kilometers, then extend it to 20 kilometers. But there has to be a way of creating quiet on the line. If there isn't quiet on the line, Zelensky is not going to have any political room for maneuver. So I would start with, with finding some way to get a, at least a limited disengagement. Once that starts, build on it. Once there is quiet on the line, start running fast uh, on, on nailing down uh, the, the uh, Minsk agreements and, uh, and, and hang out there the real prospect of an end or at least a diminution of sanctions. That, that's where our mo main leverage comes from. And incidentally, I therefore had some misgivings about congressional legislation. I like the fact that it hemmed in Trump. I don't like the fact that it means that whether it's Trump talking to Putin or Volcker talking to Surkov, he can't say, if you do X, Y, and Z, we'll drop the sanctions, because he doesn't know that, that Congress is going to play along with that. So I'm glad you brought up the Trump element of this conversation. It's you know, not a state secret that he has not prioritized Ukraine in the context of his goals for a new US-Russian relationship. And at times, he sort of acted as if, and I can't remember the exact wording, but something happened. <laughs> like, I think was the phrase he used for why Russia got kicked out of the G8. Um, you, know, he, you know, he's tended to not see how damaging Russia's behavior in Ukraine was for the entire post-Cold War security order in Europe. Um, how much 
do you believe that this lack of credibility, to, to be pretty pointed about it on the US side, I think Kurt has done an incredible job of unifying the government, but then there's this level above him where I've got questions about the level of commitment to Ukraine and to pushing forward a, a peace plan that will both be credible to pass the congressional smell test that you're talking about, but also solidify the United States and our allies. Do you, do you feel that, that you have to suspend a lot of disbelief to get what you were describing accomplished? Or you think just the temptation for this president, I mean, it's, I'm not trying to put him on the couch, to show that he could get you know, something big done with the Russians and that somehow would you know, validate his original vision of a, you know, getting along with Russia is a good thing. I mean, I, I think that, that Trump cuts both ways in the sense that uh, it's possible that he can have a conversation with Putin that is an icebreaker in which he gets Putin to instruct Surkov to get back in the game and, and to cut a deal. But I also think that there has to be a bad cop. Uh, is that Pompeo? Is it Bolton? Is it Merkel? Is it Macron? Uh, for whatever reason, this issue has lost its urgency, right? Uh, I, I think the, the Normandy format is also in, in remission uh, and that nobody is really driving this, this train anymore. And I think that's a problem because I think in some ways Donbass is the key to putting the U.S. relationship with Russia on a better footing. It is in some ways uh, uh, at the core, uh, in part because I don't think we're going to make progress elsewhere, in part because in Syria they won, we lost. We don't have good cards to play, especially since the president has announced that we're pulling out of, of Syria. Uh, and I, and I, I, I also think that uh, if, there, if there is one really strong ace that uh, that the United States had since the invasion of Ukraine, it is transatlantic unity. If you had told me that Trump would be elected president, that he would say, I love Putin, let's, let's get rid of this silly confrontation, that you would have Orban <coughs> in Hungary, that the League would win in, the, in, uh, in um, Italy, that Merkel would be on the way out, I would have said, game over. Sanctions are cooked. This, this transatlantic unity on Ukraine is dead. It's still there, in part because Congress has hemmed in Trump. Uh, but I would, I would try to kind of re, reanimate a, a transatlantic push on, on Donbass, because I, I think unless, unless we crack that nut, the relationship with Russia is going to remain very bad for a very long time. Yeah. So why don't we open things up? And again, same ground rules as before. Folks could identify themselves, wait for the mic, uh, keep it brief, and end with a question. I'll start with Wayne. Hi, uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. I'd like to invite any member of the panel who cares to, to address the issue that Andy raised in the first half which, to use his expression, was the bleeding of American politics into the bilateral relationship, which I thought was a very diplomatic way of saying things that people I know in Kiev use much stronger language to describe, uh, sort of a whiskey tango foxtrot uh, that in the last couple of weeks they have seen accusations coming out of the White House uh, about their new president and Soros and uh, former Ambassador Yovanovitch and so on and so forth that they have found quite shocking uh, and wondering what does this mean because they had previously thought that the United States, Washington was essentially unified in its support of Ukraine. And now they're seeing Ukraine being dragged into the next American political campaign and they're worried about that. They were shocked when Ambassador Ivanovich was withdrawn. And I might note that Masio's friend and colleague of mine. This caused great distress within the American diplomatic service. So I thought, Andy, you raised a very legitimate question, and I think it's one that the panelists in the second half uh, should at least have an opportunity 
to respond to, and I hope a few of them will. So, Oksana, maybe I'll make you the first voice on this because you have a foot in both worlds. Yeah. And I'm, you know, you've lived through our 2016 national nightmare, and now you're seeing right, right. some um, of these issues come come to Ukraine. I'm sort of curious how yeah. it feels. Well, I think one thing, as I would mention, that uh, Zelensky himself said that he does want to stay out of it. I think this is the thing. Like, I think he's being dragged into it, but I think they do want to stay out of it. And exactly because it is a new team, they may be able to, right? I mean, this whole thing with with Lutsenko, right? Like this so-called black, whatever it was called, like the ledger. registry ledger, right? Of the right. So um, now that said, uh, you know, in Ukrainian politics, sometimes it's very Byzantine kind of, right? In this way, so it, it is not impossible that there might be some figures either close to him or you know competing with him that might try to sort of play their own game, right? With this, I mean, I can't speculate as to like who that might be and what exactly that might do. But I mean, in, like, I think staying out of it would probably be the best thing as far as, you know, for the, and it seems that he, that's what he intends on doing, right? Um, so kind of just thinking on my feet, I haven't really kind of thought about this question prior to coming here really. I mean, I followed it in the news, but not yeah. like, yeah. So, so. so Merrick, can you talk a little bit about the, the way this is, OSV does a lot of work on Ukraine and you've been really extremely successful as an institution in understanding the Byzantine nature of Ukrainian politics. Can you talk a little bit about how easy or hard it is to imagine people inside the very complicated political game inside Kyiv being drawn into the US domestic political battle? Does this look and smell to you like something that is a Ukrainian-led effort or it's a US, you know, political circles are just trying wherever they can to find people that can, you know, document that there was some, you know, misdeeds on the part of the Ukrainian government? Well, I, I think that, well, in general, the, it is not unique to, to any country, especially democratic country, that domestic politics heavily influencing or even dictate a foreign policy moves. Uh, it is also not unique that uh, there are people sometimes in, in, in the country that they will try to, to play things out uh, and they use uh, certain uh, ideas, concepts or, or say it, certain information or disinformation basically to for their personal political interests or whatever. And I think that that is one of these uh, cases. I do believe that without prejudging about uh, how it will develop, that it is, in, uh, in fact, a, a concerning uh, uh, development in a sense that it may poison, to some extent, the, the relationship between the, the US and, and, and Ukraine if it will be really pressed on. And there is a, there is a, there is a challenge here, I guess. But on the other hand, I do very much believe, and I uh, fully agree with Oksana, that is a, there is a very strong intention on the part of the Ukrainian new government to avoid that. And I think there's a very prudent way to, to, to do that because uh, uh, it, is, it is potentially toxic and is potentially dangerous. So uh, the, the, the best to do in that respect is to, is to basically stay out of this, uh, of this uh, very dirty game, dirty political game which is uh, heavily uh, uh, connected with, the, with, the, with a strong domestic, very partisan politics. Uh, it is, I truly believe that there are some strategic interests uh, which are really uh, uh, very important here and that, you, that, that Ukraine is, is a very important country uh, and we have to do our best in, in a concerted way to, uh, to send a strong signal of support for Ukrainian resilience vis-a-vis -vis Russian uh, aggressive moves uh, and to, to make it also a very proper signaling to, to Russia that it, it shouldn't hope that uh, uh, the, this kind of uh, development would damage actually and change uh, US or other Western policies towards Ukraine. Please, up front. Uh, it's Pavel Mirdemsky. I'm director of the Polish Institute of International Affairs. 
I have two brief questions to to um, to all panelists. Uh, Zelensky tried to communicate directly with the Russian public over the head of Putin, saying that uh, we are not at war with the Russians. We are we are at war with um, uh, with the Kremlin generally. So m my questions are: uh, Should as a should we as a West, a collective West? Should we uh, should we also try to communicate with with Russian public directly, and what kind of message we should send? Charlie, do you want to touch that? Um, you know, I think it's worth trying, but we'll probably fail. Uh, and I I would base that on on two observations. One is that. I was struck by the degree to which Putin is able to change and manipulate the public mind uh, on a dime. You know, it, it, one day, if you're, you're sort of watching Russian Channel One, it's all about the Nazis in Ukraine and the atrocities that are occurring in Donbass. And then the next day, He's changed the narrative, and it's a weather report in Damascus because Russian aircraft are now flying sorties to support the loyal ally, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and his control of, of, uh, of Russian thinking, of Russian media, is very impressive. The second reason that I think it's probably uh, futile is that you know, when I have been in Russia, and I tend not to go very often precisely because of this, one resides in an alternative reality. Uh, and, it, and it's not just people on the streets, it's also Russian elites. And so you get into a, I, I remember, um, you know, I did a Russia Today interview the last time I was in Moscow, which I would not do again. And you know, I'm having this conversation <laughs> with the, with the anchor, and, um, and you say, well, I said, well, what, what about Russian troops in Donbass? Is that not a problem? What, what troops? Well, what about, why are you supporting, why is your state supporting a government that gasses its own people in Syria? It wasn't the regime that gassed people, it was the opposition using chemical weapons provided by the United States. I mean, wh what do you do when you can't have a, a basic conversation with the public foreign policy community because you have no set of shared facts. So I'm skeptical that we can go in. Mark? Yep, I would like to, well, I share uh, with Professor Kepchen the uh, uh, assessment that it's extremely difficult to, to influence the, the Russian public opinion in general. And uh, there's the public opinion is very is to a large extent formed by the massive propaganda of the Kremlin, and it's really massive. I mean, uh, Ukraine during the the election campaign in Ukraine, especially during the the proper election, they were massive uh, Russian propaganda on on negative propaganda on Ukraine. Uh, they, every day, basically, there are on the Russian public TV, there are TV uh, political shows on Ukraine, only on Ukraine, and they're extremely toxic in their messages. Uh, for example, that, that's a very curiosity that the Russian uh, uh, public uh, TV has actually made a live coverage of the debate between Poroshenko and, uh, and uh, uh, Zelensky. But the trick was that they were that they were they 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 showed picture, but they turned off a sound, and uh, the sound was the the Russian experts in a studio commenting live, actually in criticizing uh, Ukrainians. This is an indication, I've, in my perception, that the Kremlin fears, that the Kremlin fears potential influence of both the, the Ukrainian uh, uh, this debate and Zelensky messages also directly coming to Russia, but also it, it, it fears that 
that potentially we, we can we can do also certain messaging uh, directly to the, to the people uh, and precisely because of that we should try to do that that is my response so, ambassador and then a couple of that on that I also I am in favor of this idea to send different messages to Kremlin and to Russian people uh, because uh, if we manage to do this, we cut off President Putin and Kremlin a little bit from people. And that is our interest. Oxana? Just uh, just very briefly, a couple of points. Yeah. First of all, I think Zelensky would have better chance of getting through to the Russian people than probably Americans, right? Because he actually, like the jokes that he makes, kind of the <coughs> problems that he speaks to, that very much resonates with the Russian people. And I would agree with uh, what Mark is saying, that in a way it kind of poses, he poses potentially a danger to Putin, right? Because if you can show this outsider kind of coming from like really outside, right? And then actually addressing some of the things that plague Russian society as well, you know, corruption and accountable elite, you know, all of these things, right? Like that would be, you know, so if anything, I think that w that potentially has more <coughs> possibility. Now, as far as sort of how influential um, th this, um, you know, counter propaganda is, I mean, in political science scholarship, there is a lot of research and people are debating whether or not, you know, the media actually influences people's beliefs or people consume media and their choices are influenced by things they already believe, right? So in other words, that relationship, I mean, there is a ton of like scholarship, right? So even if one, I guess, before one were to spend some effort in the hopes of sort of changing minds in Russia, I mean, that probably would be something to look at to what extent um, that would be effective. And just the last thing I want to mention, that one thing also that Zelensky, at least said he wants to do, he wants to, in, um, to conduct the sort of counter propaganda, for lack of a better word, on these occupied territories. Because he says one of the big problem and sort of one of the root, you know, that something that sustains this Donbass conflict is that people in the LNR and DNR are <coughs> still brainwashed by Russian propaganda. And he actually wants Ukrainian TV, like, you know, in Russian, you know, broadcasting to these territories. So to kind of get the message to the Ukrainian people there. Now, what, one thing that he didn't really address, and I don't know if he knows the answer to this, like why, ha I mean, it, it, it's, it's not that easy. I mean, this is something Poroshenko government, I think maybe not didn't try hard enough, but certainly tried. And I think the Russians consciously like block it with various technology and so forth. But at least that sort of getting to the people, I think it's not only getting to the Russian people, it's also getting to people in Ukraine who are influenced, you know, by this Russian propaganda that's part of his agenda. Okay, well, we'd like to end on a positive note. So I think that is as close as we're gonna get. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all, Ambassador Kitwanis, Oksana Chevelle, Mark Mankisha, Charlie Kapchevin. Thank you all for joining us.